Hey, it's Seb, temporarily in London, the city where I was born and which I will soon be going very far away from and in which I'm very excited to be soon go be going very far away from, to the other side of the world, in fact. And the reason I mention this is because it's sort of fitting and ironic given the book I'm going to talk about today, uh, The Tristia, which is the first uh, poem or collection of poetry, actually, um, in this uh, the Poems of Exile collection, uh, which was being translated by Peter Green, who also wrote loads of extensive notes, which are very important for reading this. These poems were written by Publius Ovidius Nasso, uh, but we can call him just Ovid. And one of the uh, the questions I think which make this ancient text feel very alive now when when reading it um, is the question of who is Ovid. So let's start with that. Let's set the scene. It's ancient Rome. Um, after years of political turbulence, we now have like like a sort of peace within the empire and uh, there are, there's a golden age of poetry. There's lots of young urbanite esthetes who want to make their name as poets and one of them is our friend Ovid who as a young man writes a lot of erotic poetry. They're called love elegies tamed by today's standards but still our friend Ovid is writing to scandalize, he's writing to titillate, he's also got all these rhetorical skills that he's putting to use and he's getting pretty famous and enjoying his life in the capital. One of the collections of poetry he writes at this time is called Ars Amatoria or the art of love. Now remember this because this will be important later on. Um, so this is sort of like a parody of didactic uh, official poetry teaching people morals because it's teaching people how to love and how to commit adultery. But the style is making fun of the sort of moralistic uh, official way of thinking at the time, um, especially specific marriage laws which came into effect uh, during the, the reign of Augustus, the emperor. So there's also this sort of anti-authoritarian element of what Ovid is writing. You know, he's a rebel. He wants to kind of upset the powers that be. But in the year two, as in 2 AD, uh, the Emperor Augustus exiles his own daughter, Julia, uh, for adultery and alleged treason. So this mix of immorality and sort of apparently some link to political, political conspiracy um, gets her sent off to an island. And this might not be the only reason, but for whatever reason, Ovid is like, maybe I should just dial it back on this anti-authoritarian uh, erotic poetry, you know, maybe I'll stop writing love pamphlets and start writing something else. Ovid's style suddenly changes. He drops writing love poetry and he starts writing this massive epic poem in the dactylic hexameter, which is what Homer uses, um, you know, it's what Virgil uses in the Aeneid. It's like, it shows that you're writing something grand and like on this sort of, yeah, epic. It's epic poetry, basically. I'm going to put this down because the weight of this book is making me sweat. Um, so he starts writing the Metamorphosis, which is the most famous poem that he's written, like it's the one that he's most known for. Uh, today and uh, yes this huge big like compendium of Greek mythology and like kind of taking the theme of transformation and it's like kind of sprawling and it's like kind of defines a lot of the versions of the Greek myths that we now know and all this stuff. He also starts working on this other like massive larger than life um, kind of poem called the Fasti which is I think the festivals and it would be like every month of the year and describing the festivals in that month of the year and their origin and blah blah blah. Um, yeah, also these things like the Metamorphosis and the Fasti have a lot of sort of pro-Empire messages in them, although they're possibly subversive in the Metamorphosis. But yeah, it does seem like he's trying to toe the, the line a little bit more with his work as well. And then in the year 8, all of this comes to a crashing halt when the Emperor Augustus exiles him. He not only exiles him, he like really exiles him. Like most people, like at those times, like, you know, his daughter Julia or whatever, they'd get sent to an island and they would have like books and stuff like that. Um, you know, and they, I, didn't, I think Ovid could have books where he went, but he was sent way far away. He was sent to the Black Sea, the shore of the Black Sea, the very edge of the, the Roman Empire. So there's all sorts of like kind of warring Celts and um, Gauls and these, you know, tribes, which at the time were considered, you know, barbarians. It's like a much more precarious and difficult uh, and harsh way of life. For Ovid, it's very cold as well, he tells us many times. And that is uh, where the Tristia comes in. I have to pick up the book again because uh, this is what he writes while he is in exile. He writes these things and his style completely changes once again. And in the Tristia, we kind of learn a bit why he got exiled, although he sort of keeps it a mystery. Um, the reason he gives several times is Carmen et error, which means a poem and a mistake. Um, and he kind of teases us as to what the mistake was. With the poem, he makes it pretty clear it was the Ars Amatoria. So it seems that um, Augustus exiled him for the immoral poetry that he'd written, you know, eight years earlier. 
because, um, yeah, I should have mentioned the, the Ars Amatoria was written in year one or published in year one anyways, like one year before Julia got exiled. So that also like, you know, it doesn't really make him look good. But yeah, a lot of time had passed um, since then and he hadn't gotten in trouble for it. So it does seem that the mistake part of the punishment was maybe a bit more important and that maybe the immorality charge was just something like tagged on. Um, but yeah, the mistake we don't really know. We think it's political, but it's all kind of conjecture. And so there's no point really going into it here. You can read other people on it. There's lots on it, like in, in the notes and stuff like that. He says he saw something that he wasn't supposed to see, although Ovid's always understating and stuff like that. So yeah, for the first time, his poetry is now also autobiography because he's explaining what happened to himself and what it's like. Um, and like the first book of the Tristia, um, it talks a lot about the voyage. Like it goes into the voyage from when he leaves Rome and has to get to uh, Thomas, the, the city where he's where he's exiled to. Um, and it kind of flits back between the actual sea voyage and the storms and all this stuff. And then his, his sort of memories of like having to leave home and crying and his wife and the friends who were good to him and the friends that were bad to him. There's a lot of vindictive, petty, complaining stuff. Like Ovid moans a lot. He is just complaining all the time. He talks about like how Odysseus had it much better than him because he only had to go from, uh, from Troy to Ithaca on his big odyssey, whereas it's much further actually to go from Rome to Thomas, which is true on the map. But but um, yeah, like he's always, you know, doing these kind of mythical comparisons, which is very fun to read. Um, and he's always making out that like his life is just the worst thing ever. Um, and it does sound like pretty tough as well. But it's, you know, it's a part of the fun of this is like kind of enjoying the exaggeration and trying to imagine or understand how much of it is exaggeration, and how much of it is like his the truth, because his suffering, he would have also probably wanted to accentuate because he's also trying to win a pardon. So the point of the Tristia is to document what's happening to him and also to sort of express uh, his suffering um, and just, you know, give himself an outlet because he doesn't have anyone to talk to um, there who would like enjoy poetry and so on. Um, but it's also to like send a message back to Rome to get people to advocate for him to have his exile cancelled. And then like as it goes on, he starts to lose hope and he's, it becomes more like, OK, I'll stay exiled, but please bring me a bit closer to Rome, just somewhere a bit nicer, you know, than, than, than this hellhole um, by the Black Sea. Despite the fact that these poems are kind of new for Ovid and that they're autobiographical, um, they're also very Ovidian. And like, I've come to love this style of his, uh, which is of, like, for example, tonally shifting without changing the content of what you're talking about. So he repeats himself a lot. He's often on the same subjects, like begging Augustus to take him back, praising the people who were kind to him when he was exiled, furiously cursing the people who didn't stand by him when he was exiled, complaining about how brutal life is on the frontier of the empire. Lots of complaining. Like, this is a lot of complaints. Like, Trist Tristia, I think, has been translated as lamentations. So he is just lamenting a lot. So for some people, this will be, I think, difficult to read because there's one person lamenting a lot. <laughs> like, oh, for, you know, a whole book, basically, um, in, in poems and not changing the content of what he's actually lamenting about. But the variation is in the way that he like kind of gets different shades of suffering and the way that like he takes you on these sort of emotional twists and turns. There's also a lot of groveling and like kind of what's the word obsequiousness towards Augustus because he's like desperate to get him to pardon him and bring him back to Rome. But like um, like because of all the barely disguised anger, it's like Peter Green says in um, one of the the notes or something that it's like groveling at someone's feet and then spitting on their shoes. I think that is like that expression is maybe the perfect way to encapsulate the whole of the Tristia. Ovid in the Tristia says like that he's died. He said that this exile represents a death. Like, I'm effectively dead. I'm going into the land of the dead. I'm a dead person now. And he says as a dead person, it's a shame because that means he'll never be able to finish the big projects he was working on. So the Fasti, which was going to be like this big poem, like celebrating the Roman Empire and its festivals. He only did six months of that and then he got exiled. And so he says, well, I guess I can't finish it. Um, of course, he could have actually finished it in exile. But that's instead of finishing that work, he wrote the Tristia instead. Um, he also claims in the Tristia that the metamorphosis isn't even complete. He's like, no, no, I was still polishing that off and now it will never be complete. 
because I'm, I've been exiled, because I've been murdered by Augustus, basically. This book has to have like some of the most passive aggressive energy of any collection of poetry ever. Um, and like what's going on with that claim about the metamorphosis is really interesting, because while on the surface he's like saying to Augustus, oh, you know, you're so great and I made a mistake and please, pretty please be a good benevolent ruler and just, you know, show mercy and all this stuff. Um, at the same time, with the metamorphosis thing about like I did, you know, I can never finish my masterpiece, and I, I I've, I've been killed as a as an artistic poet. Um, then, like we can understand between the lines, other things are going on. He's saying, uh, on the one hand, Augustus is uh, pretty stupid because he exiled one of the greatest geniuses of the Roman Empire, who could like make Rome great and write all these great poems in the name of Rome and blah blah blah. Um, but that'll never happen because Augustus is so stupid. Uh, and on the other hand, we know that there's like a hidden appeal because, of course, you could finish Metamorphosis and Fasti uh, if you like they could be finished as long as Ovid was just recalled from exile. Right. Just bring him back to life, Augustus, and then he can continue with his work being a wonderful genius in the name of the Roman Empire. So there's so much stuff like that going on between the lines here. And that is essential, I think, for enjoying the poetry because, uh, you know, like on the surface, it is just whinging for lines and lines and lines of, of like repetitive whinging. Um, but there's all these things like that, which means that the notes are absolutely essential because I didn't know really anything about of his life until I read this. Um, and the Tristia, yeah, autobiographical. So you can read it and understand a lot of his life without having to refer to other biographies and stuff. Um, but uh, there's lots of references, especially to like uh, famous people and famous events and stuff, which probably everyone would know if you were Roman and uh, alive in the year eight. But uh, we don't, or at least I don't. Um, so Peter Green's notes are absolutely invaluable. Even with that said, I think there are some people, probably a lot of people, who just will not get on with Ovid's voice in this um, because it is so whiny. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's not for everyone, and that's fair. In fact, it wasn't even for his audience at the time, uh, it seems, because as the Tristia goes on, at one point, um, he responds to somebody. He must have got, it seems that he's responding to somebody who wrote back to him um, and saying that, could you please stop writing all this depressing, like, kind of miserable poetry? Nobody likes it. Could you just write some of that nice... Uh, entertaining love stuff that you used to do and we, we can guess that because in the Tristia he writes like why why are you asking me to do that like it, you know sure I'll do that just get me out of exile as long as I'm in exile I'm gonna write this misery porn because that's what you've done you've done this to yourselves you've turned me into this horrible kind of sniveling miserable person and so that's what you're gonna get so he becomes like a sort of angry, vengeful thing. And he says, you know, if you want me to write nice, witty, clever poems and stuff like that, like I used to do, that made everyone smile and smirk and think, wow, he's really cool, then revoke my exile. So it's just like, um, it's funny. Um, I think there's a lot of humor here as well. And I think that it's got to be intentional. I think a lot of it has got to be intentional. I think Ovid wants us to laugh at him because that makes, you know, that that part of what makes it a good poem, I think. Um, but also it's, 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 it's the line between where you're laughing at him or laughing with him or crying with him um, because, like, he obviously is suffering a lot um, and he seems to even come, like, close to death at some bits where he gets sick. Speaking of sick, I've got, like, a congested nose. You can probably hear my voice is a little bit more muffly than normal, perhaps you've noticed. But uh, but anyway, yeah, like, he gets sick and he does this bit in the Tristia where he sort of seems to be thinking maybe he'll die and he's writing, like, this was me, this was my life. This is what was done to me by those terrible people and like, you know, but this is who I was. And he writes it like in this sort of really final kind of dramatic way and then immediately undercuts it when you turn the page by <laughs> writing another poem and being like, but you know what, I have a little bit more to say. And um, so, yeah, I do think there's a lot of humor in here, despite the fact that most of it is just complaining about how difficult his life is in this, in this specific uh, moment. I don't think it would have been so enjoyable for me if enjoy is the right word. Um, I don't think it would have worked for me so well uh, if, if I hadn't read anything by Ovid before. So I've read The Metamorphosis and I've read The Heroides. Um, and now I want to read The Ars Amatoria, now that he talked about so much how, you know, he regrets having written it. And then in other places, he seems to be proud of having written it. But yeah, like the poem that got him exiled, right? I, that's definitely the next on my Ovid reading list. Um, but yeah, having read other bits of Ovid, I, I felt like like I had a sense of his style and, and who he was. And so reading this uh, really kind of confirmed that. And I felt I already 
I already gelled with him. I already liked him. I already like his, his, his writing and the persona that comes through in that. And this is autobiographical, so I, I like it even more. Not everything. Like, I don't think he would necessarily be a fun person to hang around with. For me, he's like the Roman Oscar Wilde. This is my pet theory, that he's a Roman Oscar Wilde, because, like, he's... Think about it. He's, like, witty and, like, kind of this esthete and, like, kind of very, very popular and, like, kind of has a high position uh, in, like, kind of artistic circles in society. He's also, like... Another side to him is very sad and queer, uh, which is evident in his works. And then he has this big fall from grace where, uh, you know, he comes up against the authoritarian kind of rules of the time and then he gets thrown down. And then, then the rest of his life is never the same uh, until his death. Um, yeah, and by the way, he never gets recalls. That's not really a spoiler. He dies in Thomas, just in case anybody really wanted to know that. But yeah, that doesn't come into the Tristia. So if you like Greek myths like I do, then that's a good way to get into it as well, because he's always referencing them, connecting them to his life and so on. But I think that, yeah, like it's better to have some sort of idea of like who he was. Or if you haven't read any of his works, then to have at least read some Roman stuff and have like an idea of like the Augustan age. Um, I'm really ignorant of that. I've read the Aeneid and like that's probably about it, apart from like the two of it things I mentioned. Um, but I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, but of, of it was already cemented as like one of my all time favorite writers who just can do absolutely no wrong. So it was really nice kind of reading something which felt like, you know, connecting to the actual person themselves. Although he does, he does seem to lie a lot, right? He seems to like, you know, exaggerate his case and like say things which are maybe a little bit far-fetched specifically to get, you know, sympathy so that he can get recalled and there's nobody who can like check up on it um, to see like what he was doing. So um, like who actually is of it, like, like I started with, like is a, is a question mark because he's, you know, this is, He's writing a poetry explaining his life and his situation, but he's also trying to manipulate your feelings and trying to get people like to, you know, pardon him um, specifically. Like he's got a political aim. Um, so, yeah, I found that added rather than attracting that like kind of from authenticity or whatever, that just completely added a really compelling layer of, of what's going on in this text. Um, the next part, which I haven't read, um, is called The Black Sea Letters which is like, I think there's maybe a bit of a gap um, or something happened because then he continued writing poetry at this time in exile, but he created a new collection of different poems and he called them the Black Sea Letters rather than the Tristia. So I'd be interested to see how the collections are different from each other. He also wrote one other thing in exile, which I can't find um, like anywhere online to buy or whatever. Um, but like, I mean, there's online versions for free, but it's called the Ibis and apparently it's called a curse poem. It's just like a massive poem, which is cursing somebody. Like he curses a lot of people in the Tristia, like people who he thinks like didn't treat him right or who didn't like, you know, stand up for him once the emperor had, you know, basically like get blacklisted him. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like this is one poem, like dedicated to one person who we don't know who it is. He's never met, he's never named or she's never named. Um, but yeah, the, the poem is just like cursing them and like using all sorts of Greek, Greek mythological uh, reference to do that. And that just sounds like the best time. That sounds exactly like my cup of tea. Um, but I haven't found a good translation of it yet. So I hope I do, because I'd love to read that. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading the, the other um, book in this book. <laughs> um, but yeah, th that was the Tristia by Ovid. Uh, there's still so much more I could say about it, but like, I'm just gonna leave it there. Hope I gave you a sense of what it was like. And uh, if you have any questions about the, the Tristia or about Ovid or about uh, whatever, let me know. And if you have any comments or any recommendations about ancient Rome things to read or Augustan things to read, then also, you know, let me know. Because now that I've actually read something that's kind of non-fiction, um, you know, kind of non-fiction, then I, I, I'm actually really interested in, in learning more about the time period when Ovid was around. I just want more Ovid content. Like, like I want to know about what was happening around him, the people around him, like, yeah. But anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Bye.